Hey guys, welcome to Miller's Planet. Jay here. Can you understand what I'm saying right now? My words? Can you exchange complex ideas with members of your own species? Well, congratulations, you won the evolutionary lottery. You're the only species on Earth out of literally millions that can do this. The only species on Earth. The thinking goes there are three types of civilizations out there according to the Kardashev scale. So a type one would be a civilization that can harness the equivalent energy of all of their star's radiation that reaches their planet at any moment. For us, that would be 1.74 times 10 to the 17 watts. A type two could harness mostly all of the energy from their parent star, not just the energy reaching Earth. A very interesting concept around this idea is the Dyson Sphere, basically an unimaginably large megastructure surrounding a star, capturing its energy. And a type three civilization could utilize all the energy in its entire galaxy. Humans are thought to be at about 0.73 on the scale. In 2018, our total world energy consumption in watts was 1.8 times 10 to the 12th power. Not quite there yet. But there wasn't like a clear cut set in stone path to us. One tiny little part could have changed in our story. We could be a, a completely different species. We could be extinct by now. Setting aside the billions of years it took to get from single celled organisms to multicellular eukaryotic life, and also setting aside the time between when we were like sea fish up until small monkey and all of the mass extinctions in between the two. Like just looking at the time frame between when our species were the old world monkeys in Africa 10 million years ago until today, it's been this like very weird, very unpredictable series of selective pressures. Because grass started replacing all the trees, swinging around started becoming impossible. And that's why we needed to start standing up over the tall grass to start looking around for predators. This freed up our hands so that we could start you know, picking up rocks, smashing them together, see what worked, see what didn't, and then eventually start killing other animals and eating them. All these extra fat and protein calories from meat meant that there was a bigger allowance for doing cool human stuff like tool building, thinking, grunting. This created a kind of cycle. Like our brains got bigger, digestive tracts got smaller, we became better at making tools, and then we became better hunters. Eventually fire entered the picture and started breaking down our food for us, so we had even more time for grunting proto-languages at each other and tool making. And there were other homos out there, but they did not make it, sadly, either because of us hunting them down and killing them, or they were just so few in number that they just assimilated into our subspecies via sex. All of this was to kind of paint a picture as to what we as a species had to go through to get to this level. All of the weird and very specific selective pressures. On to the topic of the video, the Fermi Paradox. Why, with the vast possibility of life out there, do we see literally no life anywhere? Why are we stuck in this space prison all alone? It's called the Fermi Paradox because a bunch of colleagues at work remember a conversation they had with him and he asked the question, but it's, it's something we all ask, where are all the aliens? There have been so, so many proposals out there, look at this Wikipedia page, but um, I'm just going to stick to the big ones right now, kind of the more popular ones, the ones that sound probable to me. Okay, up first, life is so rare that it only happened here on Earth. It was so weird, it never happened again. Okay, so if you're one of the ones that kind of wants life to exist out there, uh, just try to hold on to your optimism for this first part. So our planet, dirt or Earth, has a very specific orientation in the solar system. Not only that, but if we look at Earth internally as a system, it just looks like it was very lucky or purposefully set up that way. Let's look at its orientation. So we're right on the edge of our solar system's habitable zone, which means it's not too hot for life to take hold and it's not too cold. I did not mean for that to rhyme. We have huge planets behind us, shielding us from interstellar projectiles. We're also not tidally locked with our sun. We're just far enough away that Earth still rotates. If we were tidally locked, one half of the Earth would always be on fire and the other half would always be freezing. And we also have a moon that gives us tides and keeps our axial tilt angle and our rotation speed stable. Earth has just the right mass. Like if we had too much mass, we would hold on to too much atmosphere. We'd be a gas giant, way too hot for human life. But if there wasn't enough mass, our atmosphere could just float away. There wouldn't be enough gravity there to hold on to it. And I gotta agree with Jordan Sparks on this one. How the hell am I supposed to breathe with no air? Tell me how I'm supposed to breathe with no air. Secondly, Earth has a magnetosphere, without which the sun's radiation from gamma to microwave would rip our DNA apart like jello in a blender. And also our atmosphere and our oceans. Earth also has dynamic plate tectonics, which is good for the carbon cycle, but I'm not gonna get into that right now. Lastly, Earth has a wide variety of chemicals on it. Like it's the perfect setting for building amino acids. It'd be kind of hard to build DNA on a planet 
made up of just a few elements. Fun fact, carbon is so good at making DNA because it has four valence electrons capable of covalent and hydrogen bonding. That's why DNA can get so long, and that's why we exist. Thanks, carbon. A wide variety of chemicals that are in the right place at the right time leads to amino acids and proteins being built, which leads to abiogenesis, or turning non-life into life. Thinking about all of these factors combined, it just makes me feel like we're all very lucky to be alive. Maybe other planets didn't have the right chemicals in the right place at the right time like we did. You know, maybe there are other life forms out there evolving that haven't moved on past the simple stage because they haven't gotten lucky enough in terms of habitability. This is known as an evolutionary filter. This brings me back to my previous point. We've gotten extremely lucky over the years. Not only have we made it past all five mass extinctions, we've also had the opportunity of being subjected to the selective pressures that would ultimately lead to our intelligence. Maybe other life forms out there haven't gotten that lucky. Also, which you've probably heard a billion times, there are a lot of planets out there. Which brings me to my next point. They might be out there, but they're too far away. Our galaxy alone has over 250 billion stars. And then there's the local group, with over 50 galaxies. Even further zoomed out is the Virgo supercluster, which is estimated to have over 47,000 galaxies in it, and then there are about 10 million superclusters in the observable universe. NASA estimates that just in the observable universe, there are about 1 billion trillion stars. Now, on average, there's about one exoplanet per star. Based on one statistical analysis of all the Kepler observations, uh, astronomers at UC Berkeley were able to estimate that about one in five stars like our sun, have one Earth-sized exoplanet with a surface temperature conducive to life. But we've only been sending out radio signals since like 1937. That's 80 years. That's like 0.08% of the entire Milky Way if you're going at light speed. There are about 450 stars within 80 light years of us, so the chances that a civilization received our message, understood our message, which I'll get back to in a minute, and then sent one back, there's like a negative 0% chance of that happening. Yeah, we sent them this back in 74. Yes, this is the Arecibo message sent to the globular star cluster M13, 25,000 light years away, in 1973 by Carl Sagan and Frank Drake. The message consisted of 1,679 binary digits because it is a semi-prime number, meant to be arranged rectangularly as 73 rows by 23 columns. You might be asking yourself why Jay isn't talking right now. And who I am, why don't you mind your own fracking business you skin suit wearing take your kids to the part soy vegetable head ass here's the truth, I do what I want. And he will not know about this message, will he? Wow, not sure what just came over me, sorry about that it's probably just my quote unquote time of the month again. Then you can make the argument that maybe we should have picked something up by now? There's been a lot of speculation like a Moa Moa back in 2017, but nothing confirmed ever since radio receivers have been invented, we've been picking stuff up and there's been tons of speculation. So we've been listening, but nothing confirmed. That means that our radio receivers are not pointing in the right direction at the right time, using the right range of frequencies. There are a lot of variables here. Or they could even be halfway across our own galaxy, but have only recently become technologically advanced within the past 10,000 years. Because yeah, those radio signals still wouldn't have gotten to us. Which means if there are other civilizations out there in other galaxies, and they're kind of on the same time frame we are, just now becoming technologically advanced, there's no way we'd know about it. Or maybe they don't do radio waves. Which brings me to my next point, the water world hypothesis. So our planet skates pretty close to the inner edge of our habitable zone, and the thinking goes that if we were further back towards like the center of our habitable zone, there'd be a lot more water because less would have evaporated. So former astrophysicist David Brin postulates that maybe we're the weird ones because we're so close to the inner edge of our habitable zone, which is probably less common. And maybe life is more common in water-based worlds who are kind of in the center of their habitable zones, and land base is a lot less common, even rare, maybe rendering our communication via radio a complete waste of time. Then again, there is the chance of there being a civilization out there within range of us that's receiving all of our radio transmissions, but they're just too alien to know what we're sending. Also, then again, maybe there is some future civilization out there very close to us, but right now, they're bacteria living off hydrothermal vents on their ocean floor. Speaking of SeaWorld, this brings me to my next point. The Planetarium Hypothesis. It's like the zoo hypothesis, where aliens leave us alone for our own safety and development, but with a twist. So let's say that there was a Type 3 civilization out there in the Milky Way before we existed or before we evolved to the point where we are now. And then later on, they saw us evolving and decided out of safety 
to shield us from the rest of the universe until we were ready. So they simulated the universe to look empty. That's a very creepy thought to have. Opponents argue that it would take only one of these civilizations to act in a rogue way, and that would mess up the simulation and we would see what's going on. And the chance that some rogue civilization out there would mess up the simulation for everyone increases with the number of civilizations there are. And I get the feeling that there are a lot of civilizations. If there's enough to simulate the rest of the universe for us, I don't know if I'm explaining that right. What I'm saying is that the Type 3 would have to be pretty big to simulate the rest of the universe. And with big size, increases the chance of a rogue civilization existing. Though I was hesitant to do so, Jay wanted me to remind you of some key details of this planetarium hypothesis. In order to simulate our universe, they would have to be a Type 3 civilization. Theoretically, they could currently fool us, but there's an upper limit to how big they could make their simulation. This is the Bekenstein bound. It is the maximum amount of information that can be contained within a finite region of space. The amount of information inside a system of radius r in meters and mass m in kilograms can never be greater than the mass multiplied by the radius multiplied by a constant which has a value of about 2.5 times 10 to the 43 bits per meter per kilogram. In other words the maximum volume they could accurately simulate would have a radius of 100 astronomical units after which I assume is a universe filled with cotton candy and marshmallows haha ha. no but seriously you'd have to be pretty paranoid to believe that there is an intergalactic alien species that simulated your entire universe I am just saying so my last and favorite point maybe they've been here the whole time just watch this one clip of the former defense minister of Canada talk about his experiences a document was prepared which uh, concluded that at least four species had been visiting Earth for thousands of years. Right. So this was a testimonial done by Paul Hellyer in a congressional hearing back in 2005. He was an aeronautical engineer, or he graduated with an aeronautical engineering degree. He published a bunch of books. He was very accomplished. And I was glad to have Linda this morning finally say that there are live ETs on Earth at this present time, at least two of them probably working with the United States government. The other species that I learned about uh, not too long ago was called the tall whites. I had the chance to talk for about three hours with former airman Charles Hall when he got to know them, how he was working with, and finally they became to trust each other and have a good working relationship with the tall whites and these tall whites were living on United States Air Force property and working in cooperation with the United States Air Force and sharing technology. This may be shocking, but that wasn't the first time that someone has claimed to have interacted with aliens. Well, secondhand interacting. There have been thousands and thousands of reports of UFO sightings just in the U.S. alone. They got so prevalent in the mid-20th century that the phenomenon actually got its own name. The UFO hysteria. The incident that started it all happened in Washington State in June 1947. Kenneth Arnold, a pilot at the time, was searching for a down Marine Corps transport plane thought to have crashed on the southwest side of Mount Rainier. During his search, he had apparently observed nine UFOs. He told reporters that they were appearing like saucers skipping on water. Subsequently, the term flying saucer became popularized. For whatever reason, in the months following Arnold's report, there was a flood of reported UFO sightings. So many that in December the same year, the Air Force Chief of Staff felt obligated to establish the SIGN project. The goal was to gather all the current UFO sightings and rule them out as being a threat to national security. By the time it ended in 49, they had collected 243 reports reports of UFO sightings all were inconclusive. They had a follow-up project that started and ended in that same year called Grudge, which evaluated 244 reports. All reported that the UFO sightings were misinterpretations of natural phenomena, man-made aircraft, fabrications, or hoaxes. On July 19, 1952, the Civil Aeronautics Administration was going about its business monitoring the skies over DC. Around midnight, the air route traffic controllers suddenly started picking up blips on their radar. They saw six at once right over the Capitol. An airline pilot, Captain C.S. Pierman, in the same area saw one of them fly by him shortly after takeoff. Over the next 14 minutes, he saw five more. As he saw them disappear in flashes one by one, he'd reply to the radio control tower and they would tell him that they saw the same thing on their radar. This event, on top of the Cold War panic, led the Air Force to create
update Project Blue Book. According to the U.S. Air Force, a total of 12,618 sightings were reported to Project Blue Book before it ended in 1969. To this day, 701 of those remain unidentified. Now, lastly, I want to talk to you about a guy named Bob Lazar. Uh, you might recognize him. He has his own documentary on Netflix. He was in Joe Rogan's podcast. He also did this interview back in like 89 where he talked about how he reverse engineered a UFO. He claims to have worked on an area known as S4 right next to Area 51 on one of these UFOs, one of nine. We were to reverse engineer the power and propulsion system of this craft and see if it can be duplicated with available materials. I had access and was permitted to view and look at the operation of this main level with the gravity amplifiers and the level below uh, the gravity emitters. The center antenna is really an extension of the reactor in the center. And that's a waveguide, which allows the emission of the gravity wave, which forms kind of a heart shape over the whole, the whole craft. That's how it creates its distortion. These uh, gravity emitters can be swung all the way up to 180 degrees, and this allows the craft to essentially stand on two of them and hover, while this one swings up and creates a distortion in front of it, allowing the craft to slide forward. So that's how their low power mode, uh, Omicron configuration operate. The Delta configuration uses all three, and unlike science fiction movies where you see flying saucers just flying along like that, they actually fly belly first. The craft flies along, leaves the atmosphere of the planet, it turns its belly to the destination, the three amplifiers focus in on the destination, and that's how it proceeds. Very extraordinary stuff. I'm not sure how much of that I believe, but just hearing about the number of sightings there are and the number of stories that people have, it makes you hopeful that they are there or were here at some point, even if it was just to build the pyramids and leave or make Facebook. Well guys, I think that is it for this video. I kind of just wanted to go through some of the more realistic slash popular slash not complete BS sounding Fermi paradox theories. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching, but I need to go let the alien that I'm not supposed to be telling anyone about outside so it can go pee pee. Okay, bye bye.